So this All is right. about prioritizing meetings. This is based off of the work and the experience that I've had as a knowledge manager in understanding how people do their meetings. So the biggest thing is what drives the decisions. Um, everything that we get from news stories, emails, reports, that's what's driving this, these comp this decision points in the meetings. That's going to be one of the keys because every little bit of information that we receive through our daily life is exactly what helps us make a decision from the smallest news article we read to the report we just got. So everything is an action driving. This is, this is information flow decision process. It visually depicts how cross-functional meetings are executed by the staff for the cor corporate decision cycle and their shared understanding. The cl clearer you get this, the more that you can identify what levels of the meetings are being done. This is, of course, taken from the Army because they invented it. So what you'll see is here is the future operations piece. That is what your operation, that's what your managers and your operations people are doing. The man training and equip, that is what will be later on defined as a critical part. Because without the manning, the training and the equipping of your personnel, they're not gonna be ready to do any type of management or operations. And then of course you have your day-to-day -day operations, which is also known as current operations. So this- so John. Is, yes, ma'am. Pause, pause for me for a second here. So, so you've got working groups and you've got boards and you've got CDR, is that command? That's a something? command decision. Yes. Oh, okay. And, and this is, this is coming from the army, but it's not that different from what we look at in corporate world, right? We make plans and then we, we do some future sort of orientation and we train people to do it and then we go do it. What got you interested? Like what's your backstory that made you want to outline all of this and kind of see where these decisions are coming from in the first place? So what drove this was the need to identify meetings that were productive and which meetings that we could pull off of the calendar because we ended up having meetings just to have meetings. And that's what I've noticed is even with the corporate world is that there are just a lot of meetings that maybe they started out one thing and now they're no longer that item. And it's something that we need to go back and look at as a collective whole, if our meetings has changed. And that is definitely a big point on this whole thing. You know, if you have the IT, the information technology governance board, and all you're doing is talking about, you know, the next software package, you may want to change that, you know, or if you have a human capital council where you've got all your ma managers trying to say, Hey, I need more people, but it's been more of a, Hey, I need, I need more money. That, that meeting needs to change. And that's this whole, this, this part of the, what this actually starts to bring out. So you found yourself working in departments, support departments in the military and and the same things we see in the corporate world, where at one point we our meetings served to function, but now they've become this place where the good ideas go to die because we're having <laughs> the same conversation over and over again and we can't move forward. It was a problem here too. So you decided to map it out. Yes. And cool. part of that, and part of that was is because as I said earlier, whatever way you get your information, that does play into this critical flow. So and as you'll see later on, I've modified what the military calls a seven minute drill. And I'll explain it when it happened, when it's up there. So cool. Okay. Got it. I, I just wanted to put it into some context to make sure I had a, a way to understand what I was looking at. Great. All right, let's go. All right. So this is the big thing. Meetings are not effective. 
as you can see, 71% meetings are unproductive and efficient, and the organization spends 15% of their time in meetings. So some people can actually be spending longer. The reason why this is important to realize is because if you don't have a value added to the meeting, then you should be considering to be removed. And so these all came from different websites, the, st the statistics, because there's been a lot of people just like you that have done re deep, deep research into these meetings. And this is part of what we're trying to do is trying to show, hey, how effective my meeting is or how we can become more effective in the meetings. No questions? Right. Uh, this, this stuff I'm familiar with. Yep. <laughs> All right. So the most important day of the week to hold a meeting. Okay. Which one is it? Monday and Friday, Tuesday and Thursday, Wednesday? Boy, I guess it depends on the type of meeting, in my opinion. But what is your what did you find? So Mondays and Fridays are most likely going to be canceled by long weekends or, hey, I'm, you know, a holiday. Mm -hmm. Tuesdays and Thursdays, so those are good to have your staff, your internal meeting huddles. Tuesdays and Thursdays, they're not likely to get canceled. But there does occur the time that, hey, you know, a long weekend does flow into a Tuesday and a Thursday. But you normally set those aside for like division level meetings. And now Wednesday is the most important day for a meeting. These are the hardest days to get off in the middle of the week because everybody works the same schedule and not a lot of holidays will fall on this day. So whenever you learn to prioritize your meetings, you got to make sure to look at, okay, the boss's meeting should be on Wednesday. That gives the staff time to prepare and react for what they're having to say. And this actually helps drive Mondays and Fridays on what you're working on. That's so. it. I think that makes good sense. So like your critical decision-making meetings or your um, strategy sessions and whatnot you'd put on a Wednesday. Yes, ma'am. And then things like, what about something like an action review? Where would you put that? So an action review, I'd probably put that on a Thursday. Um, if you had a choice, right? Like, I mean, obviously you want to do an action review as close in proximity to the event as possible, but right. on Thursday? Yep. Tuesdays and Thursdays, because it is important to do those action reviews. So, and, that, and I like that the idea us. of putting the staff meeting on Monday or Friday, just because it will occasionally get canceled yep. because, <laughs> because that makes them more, more valuable when you sometimes, you know, I, we, we generally advise a weekly cadence, but if you on occasion go two weeks, that makes that, that meeting a little fresher just because you yes. missed it. Mm -hmm. So it, it helps out. And speaking yeah, cool. of those types of meetings. So this is where, again, I borrowed heavily from you because your cadence meetings, these are, you know, as you know, your team cadence, your project checks, your one-on-ones, your action. And those are just known participants, predictable patterns used to review your work, renew your connections with the people and refine your plans. Those again, that's Monday and Friday because those are known times. Your catalyst meetings, those are the ones that are going to be the fun ones, in my opinion. But you also got to realize that I use the same color code as you. The red means it's going to pull a lot of staff resources and a lot of brain power. Mm -hmm. So you may limit those to maybe two a month, if at best, maybe one a week. Definitely don't have three or four in the same week because you're going to start getting burnout. And that's a big thing. Then the learn and influence meetings. These are the ones that I really like because you have your introduction meetings, you know, you got your new person that comes in or, and it takes them a couple of days to get on board. Don't rush them on that first couple of days when they're trying to end process, wait till they get done, have that meeting on a Tuesday or Thursday, you know, you can put training on a Friday and then you have the communities of practice where 
they meet infrequently. They are online. They are there to help out. And you can meet anytime you want on them. Another big thing is definitely the issue resolution has to be on Wednesday as close to it as possible, because that is going to be a major push for a company in order to work out their problems. That also gives the teams two days on the front and two days on the back of that meeting in order to prepare and fix it. Any that's questions? A, yeah, so that's great. That's great advice. I mean, I, you know, I completely agree that those Catalyst meetings, and sometimes the learn and influence meetings are fun, right? Like those are fascinating. You learn things, you do things, and they're a heck of a lot of work. So, and like, so on yourself. Fridays, so on uh -huh. Fridays, I do what's called a brown bag. I take recommendations from the staff, and it's so it max 30 minutes. It's during lunch. You can eat your lunch at your desk, and I do it over video. The reason why is because it gives you that time to stop and learn something new, but then I also record them like you do. So that way you can go back and review them if in case you missed it. Right. And that it's, and we've been finding out that actually helps out a lot because giving the staff input to say, Hey, this is what I want to learn about. That's been a big driver on, you know, new technologies as we roll stuff out how to teach them how to do stuff and then at the same time that gives me all week to work on it and all weekend <laughs> to think about it so. that's cool that's cool and i could see how having a, a team or staff driven community of practice sort of training session like that uh, not only gives people a lot of autonomy over whether they sh choose to watch it or not and when they choose to watch it but also teaches your command structure a lot about what people care about, which they can then mm -hmm. use to inform their decision-making about workplace policy and whatnot. So that's cool. Yes, ma'am. Double so duty. The next, next slide you're going to be very familiar with. And I took it straight from your one of your articles on the web. And the way I explain this is if it's in red, don't try to put more, you know, a whole bunch of them in one day. Try to pace yourself because if you're doing sales calls all day long, you're going to have brain drain. So try to have those on like Tuesday because definitely don't be calling people on a Wednesday, on a Monday and a Friday for a sales call because they mm -hmm. don't care. They just want to get back to the weekend, you know? Your investor pitches, those are really good on a Tuesday or a Wednesday because that let, lets them have some time to mold some stuff around. So it's looking at these different areas and deciding on it, whether it's a Monday or a Wednesday item or if it's best done on a Friday. And if you take that information, then that way you can start going, hey, wait a second. We have all our governance cadence meetings on Thursday. We are not going to put anything on other than those on that day. And the reason why is because it works really well, for example. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like issue resolutions, if you got a support escalation meeting, that needs to happen like immediately. Same thing with the dispute resolutions. Like you said, those have to happen as close to the event as possible in order to drive home the best practices on how to fix them. And that's what really happens with all these meetings. How are you going to drive home and make sure everybody's actually thinking about them? Any questions? Cool. No, it's fun to see this, this application of looking at the taxonomy and then thinking about, you know, time and day of the week and, and what, you know, so basically there are two different ways in which two different things that can happen to cause a team to schedule a meeting. And one of them is, you know, they, you recognize a need and you have a cadence. And the, what you're talking about is great advice for that. And then the other one is that something happens. So it's triggered. It's a, it's a reaction against or to some kind of event. And, and I think you just nailed both of those points. I have a slightly updated graphic for you for a future version of this slide. But okay. for the most part, I really love it. Great.
All right, so now here's the cool part. So this is a military example of how operations orders are being collaborated and how they're being published. And as you can see, it's crazy. They're putting them on SharePoint, they're emailing them. It sounds familiar like when somebody in the organization says, hey, this is our new plan. And you know we're gonna put it here and we're gonna put it there. And nobody quite understands where it's going at. You know, the inputs aren't being driven with the outputs. The people aren't necessarily getting the same information at the right time. And so you got to do an analysis. And so we did one on this as a favor to a friend of mine. And this is what we found out. They're get, the commander's giving guidance over Outlook. He's not giving guidance in the meetings the order analysis between the staff and the operations section was broken because they're putting on SharePoint, they were doing this. If, if it was a share drive, some of the people couldn't get access to it. Uh -huh. You know, or is this a little bit familiar like most companies? I mean. Uh, definitely some, some companies. And when you say order, you're not talking about like sequence. You're talking about like, here are your orders of the things you're meant to do. No, this is actually specifically hey this is what we are doing for this event or for this cause and it happens all the time in companies uh -huh. um, and but the big thing is, is where are we putting them you know and then this last one was the, the important the sync meeting was not it did not have any output to be generated and i'll talk about that here in a little bit Everybody was re required to attend the meetings, but the brigade S3, you know, the, the chief operations guy for the brigade and his staff didn't attend the meeting. So that oh. kind of, yeah. <laughs> Everybody except for the people who were in charge with all the information. Yep. <laughs> and they could make the decisions. Everybody else had to go for why? Just so that somebody could tell them what, that, what was happening, so. Oh, okay. So that leads us into this operational management rhythm, okay? The big thing is it identifies a critical path between manning, training, and logistics. It defines a task and purpose for the frequencies, the time, the type, the place, the procedures. It gives the inputs and outputs and it feeds it into. Who are the specific input products re required? I mean, correction, what are the specific input products required? Who's responsible for them? You know, is that daily generation email? Hey, I hope everybody's having a good day. Is that really required every day? You know, they've got to support a meeting or a decision point, and it's got to be identified. Then it's got, then you've got who has the authority to conduct the meeting? Who's responsible for making sure it happens properly? Then who has to positively identify? attend and then who's optional you know they don't really have to attend they're outside the, they're sitting outside the uh big table and this is the biggest one your agenda should always be updated prior to the meeting the meeting minutes and due outs are updated into the agenda after the meeting for people to go over and they're published back out that is one of those key things because if you don't update your agenda then people have no idea what it's about, you know, and that's the big thing. So the military built this thing. It's called a seven minute drill. And here it is. It looks fairly simple. I've added a few things from it, from what they did, but this is a part, the meeting title, tell what the meeting is about in the title. If this is a staff resource meeting for the Barbecue, put that as your meeting title. Again, you the slide's self-explanatory, you know, clear description, how often, when. Now, the type of meeting, is it, you know, in case this was an action officer, and what that means in the military is we're going to look over something and make an, a decision point about it before we bring it to the command. Okay. You know, the place, that's important. You know, if you're always in the bit large conference room and we moved outside because it was beautiful out there, 
you might want to let people know where the meeting is. <laughs> you know, and what it produces, because does it provide a paper? Does it provide a report? What other information exchange requirements does this meeting have that is going to impact other areas? So this allows, now this starts allowing that linkage between the staff and what information they receive, because that this meeting could have a major issue if we don't have it for in the budget, for example. Right. Okay. And then, as I said, the composition, that's fairly simple. Who has the authority to conduct the meeting? Who's running the meeting? Because, by the way, that's the guy who's going to be doing the slides, get the agenda up to date, and get it back out. Keep your attendee, required attendees, as small as possible. Because I'll show you later on exactly how expensive this can get. And most people don't actually think about the cost of their meetings. Now, the next big part is inputs and outputs. What meetings or what information do I have to have from the staff? What products do I have to have in order for this meeting to go off properly and provide a actual item that we can actually work from? Because we're going to have an output from the meeting. You know, we're going to have a paper that or that we're gonna produce from this. And then the other part too is, what does this type of meeting fit into? So is this a does this fit into a talent management because hey, the IT guys need a new computer guy or what type of information? And then the agenda, okay? So I know it says a security classification check of the attendees, but also in your own meetings, you could actually say who's responsible, you know, who's got the permissions to be in that meeting because sometimes people just like to troll meetings. It's a, always shocking, right? Especially people who talk about uh, hating meetings a lot get really frustrated when they're not invited. So they <laughs> sometimes mm -hmm. just show up. Yep. And then roll call. Um, because even if you see all of them there, if you're on a virtual meeting, okay, it's okay. I see Kim, I see Lisa. Hey, who's here, you know, from the training department? Oh, okay, Dan, it's you. Got it. So by doing that, you don't do the roll call of the people necessarily. You do the roll call for the, the areas of influence that they're going to be working in. And this is what that operational management rhythm manager, this is what they're going to drive the information off of. And the Biz, the biggest thing at the very last part, it's a very, very tiny, tiny print. Date, this was last updated. Because now this is what we call a seven minute drill. If I keep everything updated, I can walk into an elevator and we can go from the first floor to the 10th floor and I can have less than seven minutes to pitch my idea to the boss on whether or not we should have this meeting. And that's the big thing. Right. That's cool. I like this. This is a, so as I think, you know, we publish a lot of meeting templates, mm -hmm. how to run meetings and they're, they're super detailed and pages and pages and pages, but this is a really nice one pager summary of all of the moving parts and the key components for success. And I can see how this will drives a lot of, a lot of decisions that would lead you to cancel meetings. You and know, believe it or not, I recommend this as your first slide because it actually starts the layout of the meeting. The agenda is up there and it tells everything. So, you cool. know, Do you, why we like it. Have you, so have you started to use this in practice? The military uses this in practice a lot. Uh -huh. I have used this to deconflict three star general staff headquarters level all the way down to a colonel. So that would be your know, chief executive office of a major, major corporation all the way down to, you know, a division level meeting where the boss is still pretty high up there, but he's not quite, you know, that uh -huh. head honcho guy. So, but this is actually just something, you know, you can have in your hand and you could actually brief from it if you had to. Cool. Very cool. So. 
Now, this is what we call the, the deliberate decision making. What this does is it shows how everybody works into their stuff and how ideally it's supposed to function. So, you know, it, the military likes their G shop, J shop, S shop. And basically all that is, is human resource, security, your operations personnel, your logistics personnel, your IT. And occasionally, you know, you got some PAO and some other stuff in there. And how they work for the commander or the chief executive officer of the co company. And so this shows the coordination of it. And by mapping out this coordination, this is going to actually start showing you where you can need to start looking at what type of meetings are done. You know, is this a monthly meeting? Is it a daily meeting? Is it a weekly? You know, and that's one of the big things. So if I'm reading this correctly, this, so this looks like um, a variation on what we call meeting flow models, right? Yes. And so the blue represents different meetings. And then underneath you have who's involved and their cadence, like how often it happens at the, and SS is steady state and contingency. So contingency might be active, an active issue is hit. We've got to redeploy everybody because of COVID or some Power's other kind of building. Right, emergent situation of some kind has has disrupted your steady state. So yes, you 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 increase the frequency. Got it. That's that's exactly what our research found in the corporate sector too. Is that as as high, times of high instability hit, meeting frequency goes up relatively dramatically, but people don't know how to scale it back down again very successfully without just freaking out. So correct. Um, so and that's what we so, did here. Ah, cool. That's, that's nice and clean, isn't it? Beautiful. Yes. So by doing this, we were able to say, okay, we'll take the senior command coordination board. So that's your senior executive personnel. It's mm -hmm. monthly. The con was it was monthly. Right. You know, but you couldn't sit, put that meeting in there any more than that because they didn't have all the information they needed. And, sure. you know, so all this. And decisions at that scale, you know, are, are not on the ground this minute decisions. They're big. Yes, ma'am. Policy decisions. That were, yeah, no, that makes sense. That makes, that makes sense. I don't know what COFs is, but those are all, uh, those cough are all is military chief. Ac yes. acronyms, uh, right? So COF is your chief of staff. Your CG is your... Um, is equal to your chief executive officer. And we call it the command group, the G3, the, the operations, intelligence, logistics, those personnel, we call their deputy heads, the command group decision points. So, so is, are those white boxes representing the person who's in charge of the success for that particular call? Yes, they are. And that's cool. the big thing. You know, you still got to identify even on an information flow. So, so I see here then that this is basically a flow governing core operations for a division or unit or some identified group. Yeah. And then there, I'm sure there's other meetings for things like, you know, personnel onboarding and, and specific operations and programs and all of that, which would be in, would informing some of these discussions, but they're separate kinds of meetings happening. Yes. And you've got here some awareness of how these frequency changes. Do you have also, then do you use that seven minute drill to talk about how the agenda and the nature of each meeting changes in those situations too? Yes. And we actually even have a little bit later on a real life scenario of how the, the organization had to, fl to flex their meetings when COVID hit. So cool. 
So, and then we're talking about meeting cost. Okay. Okay. So the more meetings cost a company, you know, how do you determine it? You know, why is it important to identify the cost of a meeting? You know, because the number of people times the length of the meeting times how many times a month, if you don't, that's a budgetary requirement. You know, now I'm always, if I've got four people, it's 30 minute long move meeting and it's four times a month, I've now just cost the company X number of dollars because those four people met every week. And that is actually correlative to this next fun group. Meeting size versus people. So this is a study of the team scaling fallacy. Basically, you know, the more people you throw out an idea, the better you're going to have. They found out that that's not exactly true. As you can see, the links versus the group size. So that 45 links, that is how many different types of linkages that those people have together. And it really, really starts to remove productivity. Now, the smaller meetings are going to be have less linkages and less time to do have the sidebar conversations. I couldn't imagine a meeting with 20 people in it and because there's over 200 links. And that's when you start seeing these people start whispering to each other during your meeting, like ha 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 or something like that. And it helps to derail that meeting. Mm -hmm. So we've got to look at the cost per event. This shows the amount of money that a meeting is costing the organization relative with rel relevant and irrelevant people attending. So what's not showing you is the cost of two meetings. If you're doing it full-time, 1,800 hours per year equate to one full-time employee just in meetings alone. Mm -hmm. So it's you got to work this to be able to understand the right cost of the event cost analysis by adding the minimum and maximum amount of hours for the boards and every and the new working groups as you're building them because – the more you cost, if you added this into your company cost, I guarantee you people would start to stand up and take notice because it gets very astronomical very quickly. You about had All a right. conversation? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, we, we've looked at this quite a number of times and the, the challenge with costing is that it uh, falls prey to the sunk cost fallacy or you know basically mm -hmm. we're already paying salaries and so people don't they they they're not thinking about that cost in the same way where i found costing data to be really useful is when you look at uh, what you get for that money so when you have the sales board meeting and it's 120 hours versus 160 is the output worth 160. And right. that's something or, maybe if we started tracking in organizations, because uh -huh. remember, this is just the cost per event. Now we're talking the total cost per month of the same type of meetings. You know, I'm pulling away from your personnel 2.5, two and a half hours in a month of stuff that they could be doing for you. Mm -hmm. That could, and now you could be showing that as the savings for driving a, because this does help using that seven minute drill and sticking to them and using the other meeting templates. It does help drive down the time frame spent on a meeting. And that's something we, that. mm -hmm. we were able to take a four hour meeting down to 30 minutes just nice. by making sure that we followed the agenda and we stopped people from having sidebars. That's huge. That's a huge difference. And when you're talking, that was 30 people. Wow. Well yeah. done. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're talking about that in a cost analysis for a meeting, if you said, Hey, sir, I just saved you 3.5 3. hours 
you know, weekly and you had 30 people in that meeting, you know, and you could average out the gross salary and all that and then times it by the meeting saved. And that's how much money I saved you. Now, this would be a soft metric versus a hard metric, but this is something that people need to look at when they actually start doing this stuff. Because you know, I think I, I think what you just said there, like about about the cumulative cost savings, is is interesting. But I I bet you I bet you that cumulative cost savings. I bet you money that anybody you told that like, hey, you've had a weekly four hour meeting. I can make it a thirty minute meeting. It's just like sold <laughs> like that, like viscerally. That whole four hour thirty person meeting sounds really painful. It so, is. right, like it's just removing that that nasty thorn from everybody's paw on that one, without even bringing the money into it, is uh, is he's a huge deal. That's a huge deal. Well done. Mm-hmm. So, and this is part of determining your critical paths, your critical areas. What is critical for the company to grow, and what is critical for everyday operations? Typically, that's going to be your training, your personnel status and all the equipment you provide. Because if you're providing top of line computers, but you're still on a dial up modem, you might want to rethink your internet background. But then again, it goes the same as if you haven't updated your computers in 10 years, they're not taking full advantage of the current technology that's out there. So this is where you start identifying those areas. So the next slide, we got from the cyber COE and this is what they call it. This was done for a three-star general and the green area, that's where you wanted to be. Okay. Because that was those critical paths we just talked about. And this allowed the cyber COE to actually start looking at, Hey, the further away the meeting is from that critical path, maybe we may not need to have all our high level executives in there. Mm -hmm. So this is all in part by the way the chief executive officer wants to have their meetings or how they want to how to direct their organization. So the more you move that meeting closer to the center, the more critical it is. And that's what we're going to look at. And if you think that the last few ones were uh, colorful, these are blurry on purpose, so because this is actually real work, work data. Each of these swim lanes was a department, and the colors were daily, weekly, biweekly, quarterly, semi annually, and annually. Okay. So, this is all what we call meeting flow where this meeting is in correlation to the next one, and what information does it drive into the next one? it ends up creating a web of interlace that can confuse a lot of people if you don't understand the basic of how these information, you know, how this information needs to be throughout the company. And by the way, it's really helpful because you doing bonuses in a budget meeting, you may want to talk about bonuses after the budget meeting, not before it, because you may want to know how much money you got to spend. Mm-hmm. You know, right, and by right, the right. way, you need to have that meeting after the performance review because you need to find out exactly how your top, how your people are doing. So I'm not going to do a budget meeting, a bonus meeting before I do a, a performance review. I'm going right. to do it afterwards. Right, right, right. So, so when you when you did that, when you if you go back to the blurry one, yes, ma'am. Were you also, by laying it all out here, were you also able to identify things that could be removed, combined, streamlined, all of them? Very quickly. Because yeah. if, if you had multiple meetings feeding into the same area, you'd look at who starts those meetings. Maybe we could combine that meeting, that those meetings that were leading into it. And that's really what this helps out because there was 178 different items on this list. And this is just a very small snapshot of it. And Mm -hmm. this is how that organization was able to move it from 178 meetings down to 55. Yeah. 
that's yeah, that, by showing I, this. I, I think that's not uncommon. So I know people in the business world will be like, oh, but this couldn't possibly apply to me or, oh, you know, whatever. Or maybe, oh, we, we don't have anything like that. And the, the reality is you do. And especially the larger and older a company is, the more likely they are to have dozens, hundreds of meetings across the company that have were started for some reason by some group that no longer remembers why they're there or that the company, the team just across the hall is having the same conversation. Yes. Right. And, and you could the, just, you could just combine them and have one conversation and save yourselves thousands and, of hours by just and that's, writing it down. And that's what, so if you look at each of these, each of these, you could call it a silo, mm -hmm. right? If you notice the very top group doesn't talk to anybody else, right? And we found out that was their human resource group. They didn't talk oh, to anybody. Uh, <laughs> the, the people in charge of people don't talk to people. Is that what, right. that, <laughs> is that what you learned? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, they didn't Shocking. care when everybody else had their meetings. They had their meetings and that was it. Your operations had a lot of meetings and are playing with a lot of different groups. But operations never had a meeting with HR. And that was a big thing. Okay, HR people. I know HR people are often looking for ways to get a seat at the decision-making table. Do this work, and then you can see where that table might be. And then you could go sit there because you got to go talk. Because that, that what you just said, I've heard that in the corporate world as well. Why are we yes. not involved in the strategy? Because you're literally not involved in the strategy. You got to show up. Um, yep. Cool. And and you got to be able to bring something to that table. Absolutely. You know? So, and that's where, so I'm going to, this part right here, it's a little bit of a pause before this next one, because this next one's fairly intense. Okay. okay. The big thing is on your operational management rhythm, as we discussed earlier, tell your customer subordinates how you want to see, receive your information whether it's via email, whether it's via paper copy printed out on your desk. I don't care how old school you go or how new school you go. Tell everybody how you want to receive it. And if your supervisor says, I want to print out, but I also want you to email it to my BlackBerry, go ahead and do it. It's not going to hurt you. You know, don't mm -hmm. begrudge people because, you know, if you find a new way, you can try it and maybe somebody will like it. And that'll be the new way. But until you can make sure everybody gets the right information at the right time for the right decision point, you still need to actually do what your supervisor needs you to do. And that's, and that is going to come into this one right here. So I talked to a friend hit, and this is exactly what happened during COVID. And this is how we adjusted it. It looks like a reggae party. It is. And, but yeah. see, the thing is, is right here is the legend is so cool because senior advisors, the chief of staff of the army, the USA, you know, these were different groups of people mm -hmm. that had to be in there. Now, if you notice, you know, we could, we'd pause some events. There's some that were proposed and that there, and then there's some that are just COVID-19 related. And the COVID-19 are just in yellow, in red, but some of them kind of might be also in yellow. Mm. So how did we, you know, this is how we re actually were able to, to take all this information and put this to an actual functional weekly calendar at literally less than, you know, seven May 20, how fast did COVID come out? Yeah. And it shut everybody down. They were able to shift that fast to a new meeting schedule because they had all this information laid out. That's amazing. So, so yeah, so March, right? So March, April, May, beginning of May. So less than a month or so, month and a half, maybe. Yep. And you're talking, um, by the way, this is a four-star headquarters. So how many people does that impact? This many commands? So, like. So this many commands, it was probably close to 1.5 million people that this yeah. major change would do. And that's why they published it as quickly as they possibly could. Right. You know, 
and that's the big thing is that if you're able to start mapping these adjustments, when you have a major influx on this, you can now move rapidly and be able to, do, to identify what you need to do. Yeah. And that's pretty cool on how you can actually take a small bit of piece of information and follow it all the way through the decision cycle and see where it actually ends up at the very end. So, yeah, that's, that's wicked cool. We're having this, this whole concept of, of mapping meeting flows and understanding these chains is, is fairly fresh. And it's something a lot of people are just really not yet buying into, right? So seeing, and one of the objections I have heard, you know, I don't want to be that rigid. I don't want to, I don't want to like dictate how everything's going to work and, and be all uptight and structured and, you know, process is a dirty word and whatnot. And yet what you've just demonstrated here is that knowing what you're doing makes it a lot easier to adapt what you're doing. Yes. <laughs> right? Like, like actually having a plan is the thing that allows you to be uh, fluid and resilient and respond to things because you know what to change. You can actually see it as opposed to being stuck in a thousand useless meetings. Yeah, Very and that's, cool. And so all this information, we, I told you, we, I went ahead and published it on Real KM and it's an ongoing series. So please delve in and read it. I got one gentleman who twittered out that this is a must read for any company, which I thought was kind of cool. So, that is cool. Congratulations. But if anybody needs any information, you know, to recap the operational management of the calendar rhythm analysis process and supporting model provides a proven and effective way to identify every information exchange requirement with the cross-functional entities. And since no methodology for analyzing or evaluating will work for each organization, please look at all the different ways you possibly can. If you need to contact me, there's my information. I've got a few certificates, not as many as some people I know. And, you know, what we're looking at is how fast are we going to run our pace of our meetings? Because the faster we change, the better we can get a handle on anything that happens and that will actually save the company money in the end. Right on. Right on. So, any cool, other questions, ma'am? So, yeah, no, it's super cool. I'm looking forward. I'm going to post this and I will post a link to your paper and your information. And then some of the stuff that we've done on meeting flow modeling so people can uh, have some different uh, ways of looking at it. Yeah. So if you have, you know, your top five steps that you would take to somebody who wanted to do something similar in their own domain of practice. I would love to see those and include, because I've got the okay. way that I recommend it, but having recommendations from, you know, other people who've tackled it in different environments, I think can be so useful to help folks triangulate this. All right. I'll have those two very shortly then. So cool, John. I'm so glad we finally found time to go through this together. It's really cool work. Like, and some of those things, those little pull quotes that you had in the middle there, you know, we took that meeting from four hours to 30 minutes and it was 178 meetings and we got it down to 55. And then we were able to shift the whole rhythm for 1.5 million people in a month and a half. Like that's amazing, amazing results. So congratulations. What a, what a wonderful impact to have on a topic that most people think is, you know, maybe not the coolest topic. So it's, it is. The it's coolest. meeting management, you know. I think it's cool. You think it's cool, but they it's may cool, not. Man. So it's cool. I like it. <laughs> That's so. awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much, John, um, for sharing with us. Thank you again for having the conversation with me. 